Things are not always what they seem, not at first glance anyway. There are all kinds of puzzles that ask how many numbers you can see or how many hidden objects you can find. The answer always requires close examination and a willingness to look beyond your first response. Sometimes the solution requires shifting your gaze, the one with the numbers. It had like three numbers in the middle, but you had to look over to the sides. Or looking at the whole instead of the parts, or the parts instead of the whole. Sometimes we must think creatively or apply a new strategy. It might even take you longer than you thought it would take to solve it. Number and word puzzles are fun. So how many of you do Wordle? Judel? Ah, okay. That's J-E-W-D-L-E, -E, for those of you who are gonna look it up this afternoon. So many of us do these games, but they are rarely of any real significance. We might notice that it took us a little bit longer, a shorter time than yesterday, that we did it faster or slower than our spouse, but we are doing it just because it's fun. In daily life, however, looking beyond what we first see, shifting our gaze, shifting our focus, seeing things from another angle, well, that can be life-changing. The traditional Torah portion for the first day of Rosh Hashanah is the story of Hagar and Ishmael. It's not what we read today. We'll talk about that in a minute. From Genesis 21, that portion begins, God remembered Sarah as promised and did for Sarah what was promised. That is, our ancestors Sarah and Abraham have their son Isaac after many close to 100 years of infertility. Before Isaac is conceived, Sarah offers her maidservant, Hagar, to Abraham, who bears Abraham his first son, Ishmael. Years later, Sarah finally gives birth to Isaac. When he's roughly three years old, something, the text doesn't specify exactly what, something happens, and an angry Sarah orders Abraham, with God's consent, to cast Hagar, who is her handmaid, her slave, and Ishmael, Abraham's son, out of their lives. Hagar and Ishmael are banished to the desert with just some bread and a flask of water. The desert is hot and dry, and when their meager water supply is gone and they are parched with thirst, Hagar is bereft, believing her son will die. God provides them with shade and a well filled with water and a new life outside of Abraham's tent. It is not immediately obvious why our rabbinic sages chose this story for the first day of the new year. Explanations include that God remembers Sarah from the first phase, uh, phrase of the section, God remembered Sarah, and thus will remember us for blessing too. The story from the perspective of the Jewish people, that is from the lineage of Sarah and Abraham and Isaac, is one of hope and the promise of new beginnings. A solid message on the first day of the year. But given that the custom is to read the entire passage, including the section about Hagar and Ishmael and the banishment and the terror, I think we need to look at the whole story. And I think we're called upon to shift our gaze a bit, to examine it from a different angle, to focus on the one whom we often overlook and that's Hagar. When Hagar is certain that her beloved son will die and that she is unable to provide what he needs, the text tells us she lifted her eyes. Whether in desperation or in prayer, Hagar changes her focus. She raises her eyes from the ground, from the place where she is sure she's about to see her son die. When she raises her eyes, everything changes. When Hagar lifts her eyes, when she looks to a place that she hasn't looked before, she sees a well of water, which may have been there all along. What had originally prevented Hagar from seeing clearly? Unbearable fear, most of all, but also likely resentment, anger, frustration, and the helplessness that arose from her place in society. Hagar wasn't a member of the family. She was an outsider, a slave. She was 
the stranger, which is in fact literally the definition of hagar, hager, the stranger, a designation, not even a name. Let's leave Hagar for a moment and shift our gaze a few centuries ahead to a story some of you may have been following. Adnan Syed was convicted 22 years ago of murder and sentenced to life plus 30 years in prison for the strangling of Hay Min Lee, his high school ex-girlfriend. In 2014, Saeed's story was a subject of a very popular and engaging, I think the most popular and engaging, or at least popular, podcast called Serial, which brought up nagging questions about the trial. Saeed was released from prison last week when a federal judge vacated the murder conviction. And since I had to look up what that meant, I'll tell you, he reversed the murder conviction. What happened? Reports reveal that a nearly year-long investigation conducted with Mr. Syed's lawyer had uncovered new information concerning the involvement of two alternative suspects, as well as key evidence that prosecutors might have failed to disclose to Mr. Syed's trial lawyers. The investigation also identified significant reliability issues regarding the most critical pieces of evidence presented at trial. Basically, his lawyers didn't get all the information that was available. Syed's conviction was vacated, quote, in the interests of justice and fairness, and that at a minimum, he be given a new trial. I heard, I think yesterday, that maybe the, one of the other suspects or both of the other suspects would probably be arrested within, before the end of the year. While this is good news for Syed and his family, unless something happens with those other um, suspects, justice has yet to be served to Hay Min Lee and her family. So what happened? Did the authorities and investigators 22 years ago, unlike Hagar, not lift their eyes? Did they miss the parts for the presumed whole? Might they have approached the story from another angle, from the one they did choose? Were they closed off from new perspectives because of biases regarding Syed's background, religion, and or race? There's evidence to all that. For both Hagar and Adnan Syed, there is hope because they or others connected to them took a second look. They approached the situation from a different angle. They made deeper inquiries and were open to seeing things another way. For them, change happened because perspective changed. For us, change can happen when we too change perspective, when we look anew and carefully, change can happen. We take another course, we shift our gaze, compassion can happen, repair can happen, and justice can happen. Rabbi Karen Kadar in her poem Perspective writes this, Perspective is the eyesight of your mind. It is how you choose to look at the world, events and possibilities. I have seen lives transformed when people make the choice to see things a different way. Many of you have heard this before, but it bears repeating. Shana means year, and it also means change. So in Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the year, we are invited to change to be open to new ways of thinking and seeing, of perceiving, of processing, acting, and reacting. Rosh Hashanah invites us to look anew at old problems, old habits, old thoughts, and to move away from the ones that are no longer serving us well or that never did. Rosh Hashanah invites us to take a second look at what we think we know, at what we think is just and right, that we think is good enough. The day encourages us to dream big, to imagine a more patient and careful self, a more just and compassionate world, and more holiness in every aspect of our daily lives. Our ancient rabbinic sages set the Sarah, Hagar, Isaac, Ishmael story for the first day of Rosh Hashanah. 
There is also a strong tradition, one we have long honored at Rodef Shalom, in which we read this, did this morning, was to read the creation narratives from the first lines of the book of Genesis. One of the reasons that we made that choice was to remind ourselves on the first day of the new year that while every day holds potential for growth, for changing our perspectives and seeing things in a new way, today is uniquely designated as a day of renewal and change. So what happens when we do a close reading of the creation story? What happens when we approach that text from new angles with open and curious minds? The French writer Marcel Proust wrote, the real voyage of discovery, discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Today, on the first day of the year, how might we approach this age-old text in a new way, so that we might glimpse of holy vision of what is and what might be in our homes and in our work and in our community and even in the world? What happens when we imagine not the seemingly fixed boundaries outlined in the text, but also the in-betweens, the ones that are not so easily defined, the ones that require a second look? I have a few. God separated the light from the darkness, calling the light day and the darkness night. Day and night. And yet, there's also dawn and dusk and twilight. God separated water from land, calling the dry land earth and the water seas. And yet, there are also marshes and wetlands and swamps. God created male and female in the divine image, male and female. And yet there are also non-binary and trans people, people throughout the whole spectrum or different spectrums. What happens when we go beyond those firm boundaries? The creation story suggests that we suggests the firm boundaries, or at least it names the firm boundaries, but the Hagas, Hagar story insists that we look again, that we look in new places and in new ways. Maybe our first assessment was not accurate or complete or fair. The world is full of color and nuance and blurry borders. Many answers are hidden. New ideas are buried somewhere, hidden below or next to the old ones that no longer work. There is holiness in the search. There is, the whole, there is holiness in being willing to change our perspective, to challenge our old beliefs. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. There is holiness in being able to see new evidence, so to pursue justice in a just way. There is holiness in approaching a new and maybe in a new way, a relationship that needs repair or an idea that we have that may not work anymore. And there is holiness in seeing that the nourishing waters of holiness existed all along. All we need to do is shift our gaze. Shana Tova.